So um, here we go, episode 56, and we are delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Tim Gabby, or Dr. Doctor, because you've got two PhDs, I believe, I've read somewhere, Tim, so when, when one isn't enough, just go for two. Um, and we, <laughs> we, we I'm, I'm not exaggerating to say that we first made contact and tried to get you on, I, I, I went through the records and checked, February 2018. Um, which just shows just how busy, not we are, you, you, you very much are. So we do massively appreciate your, your time. And uh, um, we're looking forward to talking about load, load management. And um, obviously, majority of our audience are going to be podiatrists, but it's not to say it doesn't apply. Um, but I've listened to a lot of your podcasts um, and they tend to be kind of more physical therapists, uh, physiotherapist kind of audiences. Um, so because it might be new to some of some of our audience, I wonder if we could just go through some of the, the same old questions you've done time and time again. And we'll just start off with the old classic, which is, um, can we just define what, what we would consider load to be? Yeah, okay. So typically the, the way that we would define load, it, we, we typically define it in two ways. We, we talk about external load and internal load. External load is is the work that you do. So it could be the distance that you run, it could be the weight that you lift, um, the distance that you swim or you cycle. It could be the number of jumps um, that you that you do in, in training, or in preparation for your event or the actual event. Um, and then we have internal load. And internal load is is essentially looking at the response to that external load. So if I, if I gave two people four kilometres to run, it's the exact same external load but the internal load, the response to that external load could be quite different depending on a whole heap of variables, um, one being just capacity, physical capacity to handle load. Um, it could be dependent on age. It could be dependent on injury history, but it could also be dependent on, on a whole heap of um, background factors like lifestyle um, factors. It could be dependent on stress. It could be dependent on how much you sleep. Um, so when we talk about load, we talk about external load the work that you do, internal load, the, the response to that load, and and we, we also need to consider that your ability to tolerate load is dependent on a whole heap of other factors other than just, just capacity. Yeah, awesome. And, and a couple of things we, we picked up on there, words like capacity and then, the lo- you know, preparing for load, being tolerant to load. I just want to come back to when we last met a couple of years ago in London. You, you told me a story about... Um, about a group of guys and girls at a, at a conference and, and a bit of a straw poll you did about how much alcohol they'd drunk and use that as an analogy for for sort of tolerance and, and it just stuck with me and I've been repeating it to my patients ever since because it, that they get it. Do you mind just retelling that story for everyone? Yeah, well, look, at, um, you know, we can think of load similar to, to beer. So rather than talk about training load, we can talk about beer load or training tolerance, beer tolerance. Um, and, and if you've never had an alcoholic drink before and you, you rock up to a bar, then typically you can have one beer and you get drunk pretty quickly. You wake up the next morning and you say, I'm never going to drink again. Um, but then if you lie there a little bit longer in bed, you, you start thinking, hang on, if I practice this, maybe I could get good at it. So you start to, to drink a little bit more on Friday and Saturday night. Instead of getting drunk on, on one beer, you can build it up to two or three or three or four. You might still get drunk at the end of the night, but um, you've improved your tolerance to handle beer. You've improved your beer load. Now, if you if you stop drinking and and don't touch a drop for six months, and then try and pick up where you left off, um, probably what you'll find if you spike your beer loads on the back of a very low base, you'll get drunk very quickly again. Um, so it's the it's the exact same concept with or the same principle with, with training. If you haven't trained before, the first training session that you do is the hardest thing you've, you've ever done in your life. You think you're going to die. But as you, as you train more, you build your tolerance to training, you build your training load, um, you don't get as fatigued as quickly. Um, you might be fatigued at the end of the session, but you can back up quicker. You can, you can come back the next day or 48 hours later and you can do it all over again. Um, so, you know, it's, it's probably not the best analogy to use um, when we're talking about health and we're talking about beer load, but um, I, I see that a lot of parallels between beer load and training load. Um, and whenever I use, use the analogy beer load, people just seem to get it. So even if you don't drink, 
it, it kind of resonates with with people they can understand it yeah yeah i think it resonates with people that don't drink even more that's my experience of it um <laughs> because, you know um we, which is strange because people that have never exercised then suddenly decide they're going to enter a marathon not you craig i'm not talking about you but <laughs> they don't they don't have that same thought process do they they, they kind of think oh, i could just i can just go for it yeah yeah i mean um it's you know we we kind of think about um we, we we don't really think about it's always been well um you know the marathon is here but it, the marathon isn't isn't a high load depending on where you've been um and equally um a walk to the shop isn't a low load um depending on where you've been so you know it's it, it, it really depends on on your background your capacity and, and what you've done in in more recent time to to determine whether something is a high or a low load yeah. um it's all relative to where you've been yeah i know i know when i first started i've come familiar with your work tim and I, I think one of the i mean it's not really a cliche but one of the sort of sayings that i think still resonates and i think resonates with a lot of coaches is it's not how hard you train it's how you get there that matters and that's that just resonates i think so well with everyone that's exactly what you're just saying is the marathon's not necessarily a high load it's how you get there is the um yeah yeah i mean i you know i guess i'm probably being a bit a uh, bit uh bit easy on on marathon runners because it probably is a pretty hard load but um you know i hear people people saying all the time oh um athletes loads were too high players loads were too high um, and when you look at them, you go, well, actually, th those loads don't seem too high. But you've got to take it into context to, from, you know, in terms of where they've been. If, if they've come from the basement and you're still only taking them to the floor, then, then chances are they are. It is pretty high loads. Um, if you're preparing for, for a competition that's at the ceiling and, and you've come from the basement, then there's a big gap between the basement and the ceiling. Um, so, again, it's... It's important to know well, we're preparing for this up here, but it's all relative to our starting point as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to talk a bit more in a minute about how we measure load, um, you know, um, and not in the lab, but, you know, in, in a real world, real world setting. And obviously then how we can progress load and how that fits into perhaps injured people that come into us, the questions we should be asking. But before we do, um, can we just talk about the relationship that load has with performance and the relationship it has with injury and whether, you know, we know that some metrics, if they're good for performance, they might be a bit of a gamble for injury and vice versa. Is it is Where does load fit into the story? Yeah, well, there's, um, I mean, I guess it depends on how deep you want to go here. So, I mean, the, the first the first thing I think, I think we need to acknowledge is that not all load is created equally. So... For example, you might walk around the block, um, you know, do four kilometer walk every morning and you might have good training tolerance, good walking tolerance. You can you consistently can do four kilometers every morning, but just because you've, you've built your training tolerance to walking, you can tolerate walking, doesn't mean that you've earned the right to go out and do repeated sprinting or high intensity running. Um, so in that in that example, we're talking about almost like a light beer load compared to vodka shots. Um, you know, we're talking about uh, rocket fuel being being particularly dangerous if we're using the alcohol analogy, and we're we're talking about a um, a low intensity activity which can, which probably comes with low risk compared to higher intensity activities that will come with higher risk. So not all loads created equally. Um, not all not all load variables are going to be relevant for all sports. So if I take a cricket fast bowler, um, chances are the number of times he he bowls the ball, it's going to be a pretty important metric for for that cricket fast bowler. We know that there's a relationship with injury. That if you can if you spike loads really quickly for a cricket fast bowler, it increases their risk. But if you can build to higher chronic workloads, higher bowling loads, then it, it decreases the risk. But if I measure bowling workloads in a, a football player, a football or soccer player, depending on where you are in the world, uh, it's not going to be relevant at all. So, so not all variables are going to be relevant to all sports. I mean, that's that's common sense as well. Um, so, I guess the, the the tip that I'd give give you is if you were starting out monitoring load, 
and and you had resources at your disposal, well, the first thing is trust your eyes. Um, look at the sport. Um, look at what you think are the important performance variables, and chances are they're going to be important from an injury point of view. Um, and but equally, the the work that's been done on load and injury. Uh, there's a lot of work that's been done on load and injury in recent times, probably not as much work on load and performance. So just because we understand the load injury relationship pretty well, particularly over the last three years that, that research has grown, doesn't necessarily mean that, that the loading patterns for, for injury risk is going to be exactly the same for the loading patterns for performance enhancement or performance, performance decrements. So the, the, the relationship there could be different between load and performance and load and injury. Yeah. Can I just ask a question, Tim, on, I think Ian might, might be stealing your question here, Ian, just the measurement of load. Now, with a runner, it's easy. It's miles per week with a bit of speed, and I'll often get runners to get their training diaries, and you can do a, a rough and quick acute chronic workload ratio type calculation. But you've got a footballer who's kicking a ball, sprinting, uh, doing bench pushes in the gym, how, how, how are loads and, and those other sports going to be sort of quantified to try and um, come up with their, their sort of chronic acute workload ratio type issues? Yeah, okay. Well, let's, let's assume that we don't have all the resources at our disposal. So, um, you know, there are, there are football players that we would measure external load um, through weight lifted or we would measure external load through... Uh, through the use of GPS, but let's assume that we don't. We're working with a team at a lower level that doesn't have all those resources, but they're still training in all of those modalities. Mm-hmm. Probably the, the way that we'd suggest um, is is the most common method of quantifying load is is using a session RPE. And essentially, what we we do there is we ask our athlete to give a score from one to ten uh, on how hard they found the session. Um, one's really easy, 10's maximal, and then we multiply that, that intensity factor by the duration of the session. That gives us a, a session load. If you do multiple sessions in a day, you can add those up and it'll give you a daily load. Mm-hmm. And if you do multiple sessions across the week, you get a, a weekly load. And then over time, you can, you can plot that, that change in load across days and across weeks to, to see whether you're progressing loads or whether you're unloading your athlete. Um, it's, it's probably the simplest way to quantify internal load, um, and it's, it's free. Um, and anyone, whether you're a high-performance athlete or a weekend warrior, can quantify their loads that way. Sure. I presume the professional teams... You know, with at the higher end, have quite sophisticated formulas for uh, calculating the, the bench presses, or the kick in the ball, the uh, wind sprints, or or how do they how would they do it? Uh, well, so, some would. Um, yeah. yeah, it depends. It depends how how deep you want to go. I mean, mm. it also depends a little bit on your resources. At the moment, uh, the inertial measurement units, the IMUs that that mm. team are using. Um, you, you can quantify some important events. For example, in, in rugby league over here, we can quantify tackles quite well. Um, and you can, in some sports like volleyball or basketball, you can quantify jumps. Um, but but not all not all sports specific movements, like kicks, for example, are being yeah. being quantified as well as we'd like. And we know that that's a type of load that's that's probably just as important as as running loads. Mm. I really like your your comment, which I've heard previously, Tim, about the calculating the units of load, you know, the intensity, the volume, the frequency, as you just mentioned. Because historically with runners, I would just look at their their weekly kilometers and just check that that was kind of progressing. But actually, it didn't tell us anything about, you know, the other psychosocial things feeding in, plus the intensity of the run. So we, we I've definitely sort of been more mindful of that since I heard you uh, mention it. Is it? So can we go back to talk a bit about capacity? And, and, and Craig mentioned the acute to chronic workload ratio there. And I'm conscious that we, we assume everyone's heard of it, but, but perhaps people haven't. So we know that the capacity is what we can tolerate at any given time. And that will change day to day, even within the same person. And I remember reading something of yours. We, we think as long as we stay you know, within our capacity, we won't get injured. But I remember reading some of your work, which sort of said, well, we also won't improve. We need to 
we need to nudge ourselves out and beyond our capacity in a safe way to improve. And I think I'm right in saying this kind of leads us on nicely to talking about the acute to chronic workload ratio. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, you're right. Let's let's talk about uh, acute and chronic loads firstly. So acute loads yeah. are the load that you've performed over a short period of time, and it could be anywhere from one session to, say, a week. Um, chronic load, and, and acute load is, is kind of analogous to fatigue. It comes and goes pretty quickly. Chronic load, on the other hand, is the load that you've performed over a longer period of time. Um, so it could be anywhere from, say, three to six weeks. It could be could be longer for some sports. Um, it could be, you know, around around three to six weeks because it takes a bit of time to develop capacity. Um, but chronic load is is like your fitness school. And at any point in time, we can we can quantify acute and chronic loads. Um, and and the idea there is that at any point in time, we can we can see whether our athlete is in a relative state of fitness or a relative state of fatigue. And if you look at the ratio between the acute and, and chronic loads, it gives you the acute chronic workload ratio. So if you have a, a value greater than one, it, it tends to mean that you're building your fitness. So your acute load has to be above your fitness in order to get better. If you just stay at, at a, a value of one, where your acute and chronic loads are exactly the same, then you're not going to get better. You actually have to push a little bit harder. You have to have your acute loads over your, your chronic in order to raise your chronic load. Um, it's just, and, and what we're talking about here is a load capacity. So it's like a seesaw. So when we have our load slightly greater than our capacity, that raises our capacity, which means that we can handle a little bit more load, which raises our capacity again. So we're, we're doing a seesaw approach. Now, if we have this massive increase in acute load that's well above our chronic load or well above our capacity to handle load, then that's when um, this load exceeds the tissue's capacity to cope and it increases our risk of injury. It doesn't mean you're definitely going to break, but it increases your risk. Um, so that's, that's kind of what we're talking about in terms of load capacity and the, the acute Acute and chronic loads or the acute chronic workload ratio allows us to to look at, at load and it allows us to look at our capacity to handle load. Mm. The, the, the final piece of the puzzle, which you've alluded to in there, is, is those psychosocial factors. And and it's, um, you know, we, we generally just encapsulate them as health. Um, and I, I look at them as like levers that if you have, have um, poor sleep over a period of time or you have a, a, a degree a large degree of stress over a long period of time they're like levers you need to kind of pull back or push forward on those levers to try and bring your health back in the balance because if you don't then it impacts on your capacity to handle load you, ha you haven't lost fitness but you your capacity to handle load has changed as a result of those health factors um, so so that the load that you could handle yesterday might be quite different from the load that you can handle t today or handle tomorrow. Um, and that's where the, the different pieces of the puzzle fit in. You have load, you have load capacity, and you have those health factors. If you have the, a good understanding of those three things and how they interact, that's when you're, you're on the road to understanding performance. Yeah, and it makes such sense because we see so many people in clinic that come in with their Strava data. And, and the more well-read patients are even familiar with the concept of not spiking load. These are the terms they use now, which is, I think is great. But they look at their, Stra their Strava map and they're like, look, there's no spike here. This is all. But then when you, you sort of tease out the story, they say, well, two weeks ago, you know, I had a really crazy time at work. And then one of my kids got sick and I wasn't sleeping well. And, and, and actually, although their load hasn't spiked, it kind of has, not visually, but their ability to cope has, has yeah, that's right. reduced. So uh, I think... It changes the way you take a history when you when you look at this. And on that note, um, when someone comes in and they say, "Look, I've, I've picked up a niggle," it's been going. They, they can pretty much tell you the day it happened, and you say, "Well, tell me what you were doing." You know, there was no real mechanism. How far back into the past uh, do you do you go where you sort of go, "Let's talk about load." Is, you mentioned sort of six weeks there. Yeah, look, if, if you can if you can get them to recall four weeks, you're doing pretty well. Like I'm, I'm flat out remembering what I had for breakfast. So. Um, <laughs> You know, so if you can get me to, to think back over four weeks, then you're, you're doing pretty well. But ideally, you know, it, it pops up pretty quickly. So if they can, if they can come in and they, and they say, you know, I've got a niggle, and, and you say, well, 
um, well, what did you do in the lead up? And they say, oh, look, I, I just went for a, um, a 5K, a five kilometre run. And you go, okay, well, that's, that's not too bad. Um, can you tell me what you'd normally do in a week? And, um, and they go, what do you mean? And, well, how much distance do you normally run in a week? Oh, I never run. No, I just decided to do a five kilometre run. Okay, well, how, how much have you done over the last month? How much running have you done? I haven't run for years. Um, I never run. You know, so like straight away, you've, you've, got, you've got a pretty good indication. Okay, well, I think, I think we know what could be the, the issue here. Um, other times you might have to delve a little bit deeper that, that it may not be as obvious from the load information. But as you say, there, um, there could, be, could be one of those levers that, that, are, that have changed in the background that, that um, influences the, the person's capacity to handle load at that point in time. Um, and and some, some people can handle um, spikes in load much better than, than other people. And a lot of that comes back to, um, you know, different moderators. Um, it could be their chronic load. It could be strength and aerobic fitness. It could be age. It could be um, injury history. Or it could be uh, their ability, and I, I couldn't say it's for certain, but, you know, I could speculate that it could be uh, their, their ability to, to manage stress. So when they go through stressful periods, they've got coping mechanisms for that. They manage to sleep well. And because of that, when you do increase load, uh, they don't have the same problems as, as someone else who doesn't have those external factors under control. Yeah. So, I mean, as a clinician, seeing injured runners or injured sportsmen and women, we should be asking about stress, about sleep, about nutrition, uh, etc. We should be going back four to six weeks if we can, if they've got the metrics on their on their watches or their phones. Um, it kind of just makes complete sense, and I think it's something we've always done. We always ask, we always ask about past injury history, but not always about past exercise history. To steal a, a, a saying there from a, a colleague, Ben Cormack. Can we yeah. talk about how they might, if they completely buy into this, which a lot of them do, how might they go about calculating? Because you hear this acute to chronic workload ratio and it sounds a bit terrifying. It sounds like maths. And I know you're very much about treating people and not numbers, but how do these people say, right, I'm on board with this. I, I'm going to work out my session RPE, times it by my minutes, times it by my number of sessions. I know my weekly load units. Mm-hmm. I've got a plan in the future that I'm going to get to and I'm going to work out how to get there safely. How do they logistically, if they're not medical, they're not mathematical, how does a runner sit down and do this? Um, are there spreadsheets available? What, what are their options? Oh, yeah, yeah. App? Is there an app? Oh, look, you could, you could go online. And I, uh, off the top of my head, I can't, I can't think of the name of the people, but there, there's a lot of good people doing, doing great work with spreadsheets. And, you know, they, they put a lot of time into these, these spreadsheets and a lot of them are free. So you could, you could uh, type in, um, you know, you could Google Excel, Excel spreadsheet, acute chronic ratio, something like that, and you'll get a lot of free um, spreadsheets that come up um, so that... <laughs> Some of them are. Some of them are, use uh, different modelling. Um, you know, the the, sim- the simplest way is to look at what you've done this week, look at what you've done over the last four weeks, and divide the two. But there's also different ones that de- have a decay function over time. So uh, basically, they they weight your more recent load more heavily, or, or conversely, what you did 28 days ago, they. Um, they weight that a little bit differently. So there's a whole heap of different um, uh, different uh, versions out there that you can you can basically yeah. Adam Sullivan's a guy that uh, that name just came up on the screen there. So he, he does a lot of great work uh, yes. putting together um, different spreadsheets. Spends a lot of time on it and um, you know shares it for free. So uh, yeah, yeah. there's a, you know that he's just one, um, but you know I'm sure there's a there's a whole heap of others that you could you could download and. Um, yeah. You know, that if you're starting out, probably the simpler the better, and you can always you can always make it more complicated if you want. Um, the the, tri- the I think what what the trap that some people might fall into is that they, they go, oh, it's got to be really complicated, and then they get lost in it. So if you start simple, you can always build up um, rather than going back the other way. Yeah, um, we talked about high loads being, uh, or certainly in your work, high loads being sort of protective of injury. 
mm. um, the high lows themselves. And you also mentioned about people being robust. I'm being a really lazy interviewer here and I'm stealing a question that I heard on your recent BJSM that just got published a couple of days ago. Um, and they, they asked a brilliant question, which was, which comes first, the high loads or the, or the robust athlete? You know, do the high loads mean robustness or does the robustness mean you can try high loads and um, what, what do you can you just repeat your thoughts on that for no, those that haven't listened to the bjsm podcast yet yeah it's the great the great chicken or egg type question isn't it um is it i, I think probably what what happens is is we're born with a with a structure specific load and that develops over time and with with that structure specific load it's associated with, with some inherent physical qualities, whether it be strength, aerobic fitness, speed, um, which allows us to, to tolerate an appropriate amount of load, a certain amount of load. Now, as you, as you apply that load to that person, it improves their structure-specific capacity, which improves their, their physical qualities, which improves their ability to handle more load. So it's a cyclical, it's cyclical in nature to the point where it eventually it develops into sport-specific capacity. So it goes around in a, in a cycle like that. Um, of course, um, you know, it's, it's not just as simple as load more, develop physical capacities, which allows you to load more. Um, you, you've got to take into account those those external factors, so it could be um, historical factors, it could be injury history, it could be age, it could be psychosocial factors, um, it could be genetics. So all of those factors feed into the equation as well. And and hopefully, if you can consider enough of these different factors, um, you know, and, and understand that every person is going to respond differently to loading patterns, um, it gives us a, it gives us a framework to to work towards building the unbreakable athlete. Um, now, I don't, I don't know whether it's possible to do it. Um, my, my glass half full approach would be, um, yeah, let's have a crack at it. You know, like an, um, the optimist in me says, let's, let's see if we can keep pushing towards it. Um, otherwise, we're sort of in the game for the wrong reason. So, so I, I, I think, you know, we've got to keep trying to push towards developing that unbreakable athlete if we can. Perfect. So the time has come to talk about the ten percent rule. If that's okay, it's probably the most uh, it's probably the most widely known, still the most widely repeated. I think probably because there's a simplicity about it, uh, at least on the surface, that the acute to chronic, chronic workload ratio seems a bit more complex. Just for the the you know the, yeah. the lay person looking at both of them, but you still talk to most runners that they've all heard of the ten percent rule. Um, can we talk a bit about you know that rule historically, what it was, the framework of it, and also what we now think the limit or the limitations of it may be? Yeah, look, I, um, Tom Tom Goom, who who you would know, um, is he's another great guy. He produces some great great content, and um, he sort of delved into it a little bit as well. And um, he, he was trying to find the the origins of the ten percent rule. Like, I'm not really sure where it's where it's come from, I, but I know you know everyone talks about the ten percent rule. But Tim, just I, I, I was running competitively in the late seventies, early eighties. We we were talking about the ten percent rule back then. Yeah, like, you know, right. it was just uh, yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you, Craig. Like I. Um, I mean, I, I, I've heard it for forever, um, mm. I, but I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure where it's come from. The mm. runners, everyone who runs, knows of the ten percent rule. Mm. Um, the the actual evidence, um, to in, at least in runners, to, to show that um, rapid increases in load increase risk is, is there's not a lot of evidence for it. Um, there's there's one study that I can think of that. That showed that you, that runners could handle, you know, 20 percent increases mm. for a period of time. Um, obviously, you can't just keep in, um, increasing twenty percent on twenty percent, but for a period of time, you can handle that. Um, so, so there is, there is sort of uh, rather than it being a rule, I, I probably see it more as a guide. But the the one thing that I that I feel is missing from from the ten percent rule, ten percent guide, whatever you want to call it, is it doesn't take into account capacity. So your your capacity to handle an extra 10% um, or, or your ability to tolerate that extra 10% depends on whether you have a low capacity or a high capacity or somewhere in between. So if, if you're in, if you've been in bed rest for a year and 
you ask someone to do 10% more than what they've been doing for the, for the year, that chances are that's going to be a lot of work for, for that person. The absolute load is going to be really low, but a 10% increase on, on where they've been is, could be quite high. Um, equally, if, if you're at the ceiling and you're, a, you're an extremely elite performer, then, then adding an extra 10% on is really difficult. You'd be flat out putting a 0.1%. Um, so you, you have to kind of look at the capacity of your athlete. Um, the other example I'll give you is if you have um, two athletes who are preparing for, preparing for a marathon, and you have one who has had a, well, they've both had a three-week injury. Um, one, one is starting from a, a, a chronic load of, say, one kilometre, but the other one has had a three-week injury, but he's got a 10-year history of completing 80K weeks. Um, the way you progress the person with the higher capacity is going to be completely different from the one with a, a chronic load of one kilometre. So you, you need to take into account you can't just um, say, well, we're going to do 10% for both because they've both had a three-week injury. You need to take into account past training history. And, and past training is if you've had someone with, with 10 years of training under their belt, chances are they're, they're going to handle um, an increase in load much better than someone with no training under their belt. Actually, that was my, my next question. because I, I sort of, over the years, you often, you know, treating, treating a runner with a problem and I start talking to them about the 5% rule. You know, you've got an injury, you've perhaps been following the 10% rule. Okay, let's get this healed up. Let's do this, this and this, but we're going to get you back. We're going to follow the 5% rule. Sort of what you alluded to then is what are the ways of actually perhaps looking at and predicting what their load capacity might be? You know, is this person likely to be a 10% or 5% or, or using the acute chronic workload ratio, they need to keep that down a little bit lower than the next person. Um, is, is there any way of measuring that apart from looking at the history? Whoops, we've just lost Ian. But. Yeah, look, uh, um, well, I, I think I think the, the first thing, you've got to be careful with the word prediction because people get, get yeah, well, yeah. uh, out to join over it. Um, and, but, you know, I think, uh, you know, there's a few things you, that if you use a, a percentage change from week to week or you use the acute chronic workload ratio, um, the, the concepts are, are still going to be the same. You, you're going to look at um, the acute chronic workload ratio allows you to, to take into account capacity. So you can look at chronic load. Um, you can then, uh, so that's, that's one thing. If the chronic load is low or the chronic load is high, that, that gives you an indication of whether they're going to handle an increase in load. Um, someone who has a higher chronic load is, is much more able to, to tolerate a change in load than someone who has their chronic load in the basement. Mm. Um, then the, the, the other things you need to keep in mind is age. So if you have a really young athlete or a really old athlete, then that, that might impact their ability to, to tolerate a change in load. Um, injury history is a big one. Um, because it, in terms of prediction for, for subsequent injury, we know that's a, that's a big one, if, if the fact that you've been injured before. And if you, if you have a poor injury history and, and therefore a poor chronic training load, um, chances are your strength and rugby fitness is down. And, and those two factors are pretty important in terms of your ability to handle load and changes in load. If, if you're stronger and have better aerobic fitness, you're much better able to handle spikes in load. Um, so there's kind of, we call those moderators. There's five moderators that you can use other than just um, change in load or the acute chronic ratio to determine whether whether you're going to increase or decrease. So the, the last thing too is that whenever you load, you have to feed, you have to either use it as a feedback or a feed forward system. You look at the response to load. So you look at um, soreness, you look at well-being, you look at sleep quality, you look at mood. Um, if their well, wellness is or well-being is tracking along well, then it indicates that they're handling the load. So you, it tells you you can go back and load again. But if if they're going to bed sore and waking up sore, um, then it, it's an indication that they're not handling load. So you might have to to pull back a little bit on the load to to make sure that the that load isn't isn't exceeding their their capacity to handle at that point in time. Sure. Actually, we've just had a question um, from Tim. I just It's sort of related to that. Let me just bring the question up. It's just 
are you able to expand on the theories of why we see the delayed injury risk for up to six weeks following spikes? Um, does that make sense? It's sort of, you know, what's the time frame between a spike and an injury? <laughs> yeah, look, I don't, I don't know that I've seen um, a six week, a six week delay. Um, there, there might be some studies that have seen it, like in in team sports. Um, you know, we, we tend to see a, a one week delay for, for bony stress injuries. It might be a little bit longer. Um, it, there's a couple of things that we need to keep in mind. There is that the loading, the loading profiles of, of different, uh, the load injury profiles for different tissue types will differ. So um, where we might have a, a protective effect of higher loads on muscular injuries, um, bony stress injuries tend to sneak up on you a little bit. So it, they tend to, to come over a longer period of time, um, and it could be it, it could be a, a long. You know, I think in, in cricket they've seen um, almost like a three a three month delay. I know John Orchard's work has, has seen after they spiked workloads, it's a you know up to a three or four week delay. And I can I can only assume that there's there's something going on at a cellular level. Uh, I'm not a, a molecular biologist by any means, but I can only assume that there's something that's going on at the cellular level that that's occurring in these different tissue types that that uh, results in a d delayed risk. I mean, the, the thing that, from a simple simple point of view, is if if you're training training hard at this point in time today, then you're obviously not injured. Um, because your loads are high, um, but if you if you sustain that over a long period of time, then then at some point in time it comes back and, and bites you. And equally, um, you know, this is why we have to build in a delay or a lag effect into our analysis because you could have someone um, who breaks down early in the week, say they break down on Monday, um, that the load that they accrue throughout the week is going to be very low. So unless you build in a, a lag effect there, you would you would interpret that low loads have caused the injury. Low loads have um, contributed to injury risk, but it's it's not necessarily load in that case. It's because they just haven't had the chance to accrue load. Um, it's So you need to go back and look at what they've done rather than where they are at this point in time. And I think, I think the lag effect, we're only really starting to understand the lag effect now um, because a lot of our previous work, particularly um, in, the, in the period, you know, before, say, 20, 2014, say, was um, we were looking at the load at this point in time and injury at this point in time. Um, it's only in recent times that we've, we've started going, actually, we need to build in a lag effect. What have you done now, but how has that affected us down the track? Mm -hmm. um, so great uh, you know intuitive as all of this completely completely sounds not it's not just intuitive it's it's you know it's co it's theoretically coherent it's biologically plausible it stood the test of time we've got lots of published work i came across a video recently of someone who had uh, was presenting some um a critique of it a critical appraisal very professionally and and uh I know you were in the room at the time. It was in the in, Swi in Switzerland at the Sport Physio Conference. Would you mind um, summarising what the main the people who are, perhaps are, are have been criticising this more recently? What's their what's their main criticism of it, and is it is it valid? Um, I don't I don't know. Maybe you can tell me what um, I haven't. It was it was six months ago that I was in uh, Switzerland. Do you, do you remember what the I mean, main was? I think his main concern, and it was, it was, I don't know if his doctor or professor, and apologies in, to him in advance if I mispronounced it, was Franco Impelizzeri, who's at the, uh, I want to say the University of Sydney, but I might be wrong. Um, um, his main, one of his main points, I think, that he mentioned a couple of times was just how much of the work was published in an editorial fashion, rather than a, being more, you know, he was talking a lot about there being uh, a lot of editorials or commentaries or reviews in the BJSM. Um, and he didn't feel that that was, uh, was as scientific as it could be. That was kind of one of, one of, his, uh, one of his concerns. Right. Um, look, uh, first, thing, first thing I would say is um, j just like any, any science, um, science has had debate and discussion and, and differences of opinion um, as long as science has been around. So, um, you know, I, I welcome any discussion on, um, on any, any topic. 
um, you know, in, in terms of no one, no one owns load. Um, the people working in the load injury area aren't aren't working against each other. We're all, actually all working towards the same goal. Everyone wants to get um, athletes available more frequently, and they want to they want to get the best performance as possible and keep the athletes as healthy as possible. So we're all working towards the same goal. Um, what what I would what I would encourage is um, for for people who who are interested in the debate, make make sure you you look into um, look into all the research, look into all of the evidence, but also consider the strength of the evidence. Um, and uh, there, there are some there are some editorials, but I I, I don't think that um, I, I'm not sure whether whether that in itself is a is a valid criticism because there's probably just as many editorials. Um, which are opinion pieces that are critical of the acute chronic ratio as there are in support of the acute chronic ratio. So I'm not, I'm not entirely sure that um, the editorial argument is, is as valid as, 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 um, or is as problematic as, as what some people have led, led, have been led to believe. Um, in terms of, in terms of, um, the actual the actual evidence that's that's out there. Um, I mean, the, the, there's a lot of evidence from a lot of different research groups and a lot of different sports now that have shown pretty pretty consistent results. And the first is that if you spike workloads, um, it increases risk. And secondly, if you can build to higher chronic workloads, then it decreases risk. Um, at, at the moment, there doesn't there doesn't seem to be the body of evidence to um, disprove that point. Um, so, so what I would really encourage is, if if people have a, a different point of view, or they they are completely um, are completely against um, this model or this approach, or they have another theory, then then what I really encourage them to do is um, do what the other people have done and. And actually, do some research to, to prove that theory, um, and and that's all that science is. Like, no, at the end of it, I can almost guarantee you, um, we'll all be proven wrong. Um, that none of us will be right. So, um, every everyone is just going to be advancing advancing the, the area, and um, you know, in five years' time, we'll be talking about something else or a different way of looking at it. That's um, that's the way I look at it. So. Um, you know, I don't know if that if that answers the, the question. I like, but I would encourage as as much discussion about the topic and and for people to to delve into it and form their own opinions. I think that's yeah, that makes one, sense. I think that's one thing that has struck me about following that body of literature is the remarkable consistency across sports. Um, obviously, you know, we're, I'm mostly involved in we're mostly involved in, in runners, which the loads can be measured, but that. A so-called sweet spot in the acute chronic workload ratio seems to be quite consistent in rugby, football, cricket. Uh, you know, it's it, it's it's it is well, it's consistent. <laughs> yeah, look, the 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 finding it may be the the act the actual um, absolute mm. number will differ yeah. from sport to sport. Um, uh, some sports are lower, some sports are higher. You know, the actual sweet spot danger zone is is mm. meant to meant to be um, for for. Um, Illustrative purposes more yeah, than anything. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a just good point. <laughs> highlight a point that it's that there's no magic number there, mm. um, and and equally you could you could have some athletes who are theoretically in the sweet spot and their risk of injury is quite high. Some people are theoretically in the danger zone and their risk of injury is really low. So, um, you know, I can I can tell you that in a group of forty athletes, on average, if we if we spike their workloads, if we ask them to double what they they normally do, um, then we increase the risk in the group. But I, I can't tell you with any accuracy. Um, I can't predict with any accuracy uh, which one of those ath individual athletes are going to break down. Um, and that's that's you know perhaps a, a criticism is um, that we can't predict injury with with the acute chronic workload ratio, but we can't predict injury with anything else either. You know, I, I don't think anyone who's working um, in the field uses one single value 
to try and manage their athletes. They're, they're using a number of different data points and and conversations amongst staff to manage their athletes. Mm-hmm. Um, it's to, if we think that we're going to be able to boil um, health and performance and injury reduction down to to one number, you know, I think mm-hmm. I think we're in a, a bit of trouble there. I think uh, you've always been very vocal, uh, quite rightly, in that risk doesn't equal rate. I think I'm, I'm uh, quoting you correctly there. And yeah. I think when people took that graph of yours, they they perhaps it was a little bit misinterpreted. Did you ever think that graph would be as 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 viral, if that's the right word to use, or as popular as it was? Because it just it just went like wildfire, didn't it? No, I often joke that if I if I you know. I often joke that, you know, I've actually done a little bit of work before I produced that graph. Um, and if I had known that all I had to do was add a bit of colour to my graphs, <laughs> you noticed I would have done it years ago. Um, look, but, you know, I'm as, you know, uh, I'm as, uh, as hard on myself as, as anyone else can be. You know, I'm probably my own biggest critic. So um, I, I look at, the way it gets interpreted and a lot of a lot of my responses that, that come out in papers is about making sure that um, people don't misinterpret it and and once once it's on Twitter, Twitter's a different world right ten, 10 years ago um, you know I don't know even if Twitter existed I don't know but um, it was a different type of dissemination um, of research the way we, we disseminated research was different um, was different and uh, you, you can't really interpret what what one says about a particular graph. Um, you know, they once they say it, and then it's like Chinese whispers. It grows and it grows and it grows, and then um, suddenly, well, um, you know, this graph can actually cure cancer. You know, or, or the Q-chronic ratio can, you know, can it can do lots of different things. But you no, know, uh, you can't you can't control a lot of that. All I can try and do is is correct correct it when it's when people have misinterpreted that that risk doesn't equal rate um just because someone's at risk of injury doesn't mean they're definitely going to break down all we've all it does is it gives us a an indication that risk may have increased in that group oh, yeah perfect so i think that's a great point take home point to round up on Craig, before I give Tim's London-based course a plug, is there anything that's coming yeah. through the Facebook Look, group yeah, you want to mention? There's, what, there's a question here from Michael Nitsky. Hey, Michael. Um, he, he just asked, is there a particular training characteristics, or sorry, training characteristic that gets spiked that tends to be more likely related to an injury? For example, increasing speed, pace, intensity versus, say, the volume duration. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it's a good question, Michael. Um, we're doing some work at the moment with runners, and and there's there's not a there's not a, um, a heap of work. There's a systematic review that that found I think four studies on on runners recently. You know, so there's for for the 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 number of runners that are out there and the amount of research that's out there. It's it's kind of funny, but I, I, I would speculate, and, and this is where you know I'm, I'm just giving you my gut feel now is that. Perhaps volume, volume. Um, if you if you spike volume, then maybe you, it increases your risk of bone stress injuries. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas if you if you rapidly increase intensity, then maybe that increases your risk of muscle injuries. Um, and again, I'd be I'd be speculating, but again, um, as a group on a group level, that's maybe what we'd see. But then you might find that for individuals on an individual level, that um, different metrics uh, are more are more related than, to injury than others. So it could be high speed running is related to particular injuries for one athlete, but the the amount of um, slower, higher volume work is related to injuries in another athlete. And at the moment, you know, there's a lot of questions there. Just um, not enough time to answer them. Yeah. No. Yeah. Perfect. Anything else, Craig? No, there's a couple other questions there, but we'll just hold over over those because um, I'm conscious of the time. So, um... perfect. So, so Tim, what we'll do is in in the, we'll, we'll link to your website where we you know which has got uh, all the papers you've published. I know you've always been very generous in in providing copies of papers to people if they want them and things. So we'll link to your website. But um, you're doing a bit of a tour of is it the world or is it Europe? <laughs> um, uh, I, Europe. I know you're coming. 
Europe, Europe. So you're coming through our way in, in London on uh, Sunday, the 12th of May. I'll put a link as well to where people can get tickets for that. Um, it's yeah, in really one of the clinics I work in. Yeah, yeah. And um, what other parts? Because we do have people from across Europe that watch. What What is your Europe tour? What, what, what are you taking in? Uh, well, um, I'll be in Poland, uh, the Netherlands, Sweden, uh, France, Spain, Italy, Norway. Um, so in May, awesome. if in May, if you're interested in, in load management, um, and we'll, you know, there's, there's all sorts of stuff that we discuss, you know, and we, we learn a lot from each other as well, you know, so it's not, it's not there for me to say I have all the answers, but um, if you want to learn a little bit about, um, rehab and progressing loads and, um, you know, we, we discuss a lot of different stuff and, and there's a lot of, a lot of good discussion in the room that, uh, where we all sort of, um, benefit from from each other's experiences so if you're interested um you'll find me somewhere in europe in may <laughs> perfect i'll put a link to, i'll put a link to the london course because i know the link for that but where can people across the rest of Europe? where can they find out details of, of coming to to uh attend your courses is it on your website yeah okay, cut, um, go to the website gabbitperformance.com and um yep. Scroll down the bottom left, and you'll find all the all the different uh, locations. Just click on the link, and it'll take you directly to wherever you want to go. So, um, yeah, like I, I really enjoy getting out, and um, you know, it's one thing to, to write write a paper, but it's a, another thing to actually sit in, sit with a, a group of people and actually talk about it, and and for them to have the questions that they've written down um, and have have a discussion about it. Um, that's that's one thing that I think is missing a lot. Uh, from researchers in general. Um, so it's good to get out and actually talk about the stuff with people who are actually using it. Awesome. I mean, just can't thank you enough again for your time uh, this morning for me, this evening for you. Really, really appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, it's a pleasure, guys. I, I really appreciate your time. Right, I uh, really like what you're doing, trying to get a positive message out there. Right. Look, so, so thanks a lot again, Tim. Thanks, Ian. Um, we've had lots of people come and go in the hour. For those of you who've just arrived... Um, Facebook render this video it's on about 10 15 minutes it will be the whole video will be on Facebook I'll upload it to YouTube tomorrow um, and then the podcast version will be available soon so thanks again Tim and thanks Ian thanks, thanks guys